how are we actually dealing with failures? Is it okay to help them? And what are the consequences? The first thing that you can do as a leader, in my opinion, is admitting failures yourself. It's not just about coding. It's about helping others. It's about moving your product forward. This is also part of your job. Find yourself a good group that supports you and also find yourself a diverse group. Hi, I'm Maria. And welcome to Agile Leadership Podcast, where I deconstruct the role of engineering manager. Try to make sense of the role confusion and understand the challenges with the transition from a developer to a leader, or like in today's case, from a scrum master to a leader. You can find this interview on YouTube and in the podcast. See the links in the description. And today I have with me my dear friend and soon-to-be mom, Jana Reiche. Congrats, Jana. I am so happy to have the both of you here. Thank you very much. Happy to be here with you today. <laughs> today, Jana is a team lead technology at Around Home. Around Home helps over 15 million house owners in Germany to find their match with a partner who helps them in the projects around home, like changing the windows or getting a new heating system. I would say that it's like a Tinder or Bumble for homeowners and the contractors, right? <laughs> Exactly. And we also have this claim inside our company, it's all about matchmaking. So okay. yeah, in the end, it is a bit like this. Yes. <laughs> that sounds interesting, but it's only in Germany right now, right? Yeah. Okay. So I, I cannot find a match. <laughs> it's it's work. like the craftsman to match with, right? <laughs> <laughs> At work, Jana leads engineers and she used to lead also Scrum Masters in their personal development, goals, team spirit, processes and achievements. I used the description you have on LinkedIn. I love that you mentioned team spirit. I would like to go back to this later. <laughs> we can. Jana and I go way back together again back to free now. I already interviewed a lot of people from free now <laughs> uh, where we both work as scrum masters. I think we had like the best scrum master team in free now, don't you think? Yes, for sure. It was a very inspiring group and I'm super happy to still be friends with uh, most of you actually. So yeah, um, right. Always have this as a great yeah, connection and, and also inspiring group to, to share some thoughts with and get some inspiration from. Yeah, that's great. So we have so much to talk here, Jana. The first thing that comes to my mind is about the difference, because when we were working in Free Now, you were working as a Scrum Master in a team, and now you are a team lead in a team. Could you tell me what are like the biggest differences that you see? in those two roles? Because I understand that there might be some things that are very similar, right? Yeah. So it's actually very interesting. I was having the check-in with our new Agile coach uh, beginning of this week, and I was telling her about my struggles and also the changes, because as I used to work as a Scrum Master, I know lots of things that a team can do, right? But uh, on the other hand, now working as a team lead, I'm trying to be super careful with yeah, let's do this because what's going to happen if the team lead says, yeah, let's try this, everyone's going to follow, right? It's like the management order to do this and that. Um, so I'm really trying to balance those things. For me, it's really visible to see that as a scrum master, you are like an agile coach. You are more this person that is giving an advice, like a, you know, nicely meant uh, thing that the team can consider or maybe not. Whereas as the team lead, people really look at how you are behaving, how what decisions you are taking, and are also more blindly following what you are saying because of just the hierarchy that you have in the end. Wow, that's interesting. I wouldn't expect that to be the first thing. But yeah, it makes sense. This is actually very interesting for me, especially that given that you are a team lead right now, because I, I'm depending on how the team leads is the personality, the way and the management style, you can see that you can either empower the team or you can really put the team down. There are people that are very, they just prefer to get, or they understand that those are orders and they need to follow, right? So how do you manage that so that you can empower the team? So in my observation also from working with several different people, it really also depends on the personality of each one of them. Do you so mean I, the personality of the leader or the team members or everybody? 
<laughs> I mean, for me, from my perspective, personality of the team member. So I have had people that actually really like, or not like, but are used to hierarchy um, mm -hmm. and are respecting this somehow. Whereas um, I have also gotten the feedback from uh, some of my, my team members, you're actually more of a friend and sometimes it feels also hard to, uh, you know, find this manager um, or, or team lead uh, um, employee kind of relationship with you. And on one hand side, it's really good because you have a very trustful relationship and you are actually really spending a good time together, are open to talk. But on the other hand, it can also cause the that, yeah, like lines are kind of blurry, right? And when is it actually the point to say, okay, now I'm taking a decision as your team lead or now I'm giving you an advice as empowering background agile coach person uh, or a friend that you're having, which I think is not really a, like a super bad problem. In my opinion, leaders should just be aware of this. And um, in the end, this is all about empowering your team. When you are aware of which role or, you know, like which hat am I wearing right now? Am I the friend? Am I the leader? Am I the agile coach for the team? And really make this explicit um, to to your team as well like in which position are you right now am i giving you an advice out of my personal experience or am i actually using my veto right as your team lead to say no <laughs> that's not going to happen we're going to do it this way because of this and that reason of course you also have to explain that and how do you do that like i understand it's clear for you which hat you're wearing at the time and how do you make sure the team knows which, which uh, person they are talking to. So, I, I mean, curious to see what my, my team actually would say <laughs> about that. What I'm trying to do is actually saying it. So now I'm giving you my personal opinion or now I'm actually using my, my feature rights here, um, uh, which I do try to use very rarely. Like we had like one or two occasions where I said, okay, no, this, I don't see that this is gonna work. So let's do it in that way. Okay, but makes sense. The team had time to experiment already on other things. And and what I'm also trying to do whenever I use my, my team lead opinion here is also trying to phrase it as an experiment, right? I think that this would be a good idea to try it out. So let's do it for one sprint or like depending on the experiment, what you want to find out. And let's see if that actually works and helps for you as a team. But out of my experience as an agile coach or as a leader, I see that trying this and that would actually be helpful for you as a team. That's nice. I love the experiment part. And it's also so much easier to sell an idea, right? Because it's not always just to sell it, but to like have a little bit of buy-in from the team and not for them not to feel that you are imposing something. Yeah, and it, it doesn't have this feeling of it's never going to be rolled back. If I don't like it, right, then I can still say, I have like my good reasons that I found out. And also for me, I mean, what I have learned over my years of working with different teams, one thing works for one team and it might not necessarily work for the other one, right? So just because I think it's a good idea to do it, I, I also know not everything in this world, right? So. Yeah, and I think that's really great that you are open to admit that you don't know everything, you know, because... I think there is a lot of managers or leaders that they, when they are promoted, they become a leader, they feel that they have to know everything mm -hmm. and that they cannot ever show that they don't know something because then their, um, their reputation is undermined and they would feel that, oh my God, I'm not a leader then. So then just they just push through acting like they know everything. Yeah. So I would like to also ask about because it's quite recent. How long have you been a leader now in around home? Almost two years. Almost two years? Oh, wow, that time, time flies. flies. It's <laughs> not so recent. But still, I would like to ask, maybe you remember. Um, did you feel like you are entering into a role? Because you used to be a scrum master like I did, like an agile coach, like a buddy for the team. And suddenly you know that you enter into a role and you think, how do I do this role? Do you feel like you entered into a role or do you feel like I just wanted to be myself? How do you see this change happen? 
So for me, it's actually really important to be myself and to do things that I can also um, rely on or, or to not change how I'm interacting with people. Of course, um, in certain situations, it is a bit required, right, that you are adjusting your, your leadership style towards the situation or the people that you are having. I mean, as a scrum master, I never had to worry about actually firing someone or uh, giving, I mean, we gave critical feedback, right? But in the end, it was like a peer feedback that you are giving versus now when you give critical feedback as a manager, it's like this, it has consequences for his case, right? So um, it's really something that then became more explicit to me. But other than that, I'm trying to really be myself and not really yeah, changing how I'm interacting with the team. I have also observed what you were saying beforehand, that people try to like go into this role and then behave differently. For me personally, that just doesn't work. Like I could not go to work every day and try to put on a mask and try to be someone that I'm not. Like either it works the way I am, and of course I can learn things and maybe be more cautious about decisions that I'm taking and how I'm interacting with the team. But in the end, it's me. And that's how I bring to work. And yeah, I, I don't have anything else to offer. I love that. And I'm so glad you met, we, we have a chance to talk about this because especially for us that we were, you know, agile coaches, those bodies, it's a bit different than I imagine for the developers that change to the role. It's also probably different whether you become a leader of people you already knew or in a new team that they didn't have this total body approach yeah. with you. But I'm really glad that you're mentioning that. I think that's really important. And one of the quotes that I love and I invented uh, listening to Gabor Mate's uh, parenting lecture is that leadership is not a role, it's a relationship. Mm -hmm. So this is the thing, like, because it was, I paraphrase, parenting is not a role, it's the same. You will learn soon. <laughs> That, yeah, that it's not like that suddenly you are a different person because you need to have authority or like recognition or like some kind of special place in other people's head because you are a leader and they need to obey, you know. I think what also made it easier for me is actually going to a different company and starting the different roles. So I didn't have any background with the people, right? So they just knew that, yes, I was working as an agile coach. It was also something that the company really needed, like this knowledge on, on agile in total. Um, so they were like, okay, that's a good fit for us as a, as a company in general. So then of course you have this whole onboarding time and actually building up a, a recognition somehow in the, in the company and that people know you, right? And that they know what kind of things they can ask you with. But on the other hand, you really start on a green field making new relationships and they are not biased by how you were behaving beforehand. I do think that doing this step in the same company is actually quite complicated. So I, like, at least for me, I would say I could have not been super confident in doing this, for example, in free now because people know you as the coach, right? And all of a sudden you go towards people know you as the leader and that's that's a tough transition yeah i spoke about that last week with miguel who used to be a developer and then he moved and he was saying how hard it was that you know your peers suddenly become your reportees and it's hard and not everybody will recognize that like people will be you know you are i don't i just don't i just don't recognize you and you have to deal with that. So yeah, I think it's for sure a bit easier. It's not easy, but for sure a bit easier. But that's a good segue for me to ask about, because you were original guest here, uh, because not only to mention that you're a woman, which I, I decided not to go into that too deeply oh, because, <laughs> yeah, because, you know, I think we should just treat everybody in the same way. But... I would love to go into the fact that you transitioned from a Scrum Master role. And I would like to understand because in the end, I could call you an engineering manager, right? There's no universal definition for any of those role confusion, which I say like 
team lead, tech lead, engineering manager. It de so depends on the company that you work for and what they define. So I would like to understand how is the team, the team set up? Is there a, like a tech lead, somebody who's like responsible for the technology? Like, is there an architect, somebody who, how do you manage the team and what are actually your responsibilities as a team lead? Yeah. So maybe I start actually with giving a bit of background on how do we decide for the, the role itself? What is maybe also the history of this role and how is the general team set up? Great. So actually, when I started, um, my role was called people lead to really make it very clear that this is a lot about people and not about technology in the end. So what I really liked about it is that you have this dedicated people focus and with the background that I have and working in engineering teams, of course, I, I know things, right, but I'm not the person to actually go, go into technical solutions with the team, which in my opinion is a very good setup for, for a team lead to have because you have this natural distance between you know, the actual coding part and then the, the people part and the vision of the team that you do together with your product manager and how do I support the company vision, the technology vision in the end. So this is what this role initially was all about. Okay, um, I have some questions there if I can. Yeah, go. <laughs> First one, if you were a people lead, were you like in the people's department? No. Huh, okay, so still in technology? Yeah, yeah, it was but on the people in side. tech, um, there were people leads um, for each team. That's cool. So in the end, it was kind of like a team lead already, but our former <laughs> CTO decided to give it this people lead um, title to really put the focus on people and not so much on the team. Nice. And on then the I have a second question before yeah. you move on. And um, because I imagine it's like you are this neutral person in the team. You don't, if you are not from technology, the tech part, you are not from the product. So then you can give like a better overview and not take sides because I think maybe I'm mistaken, but I think like if, if there is a very technical lead, they will have always the bias for technology, for driving the, you know, b being like, technology excellent or doing stuff like in that way so there would be always this kind of friction or maybe not with the product or with somebody else in the company and if I, I like that part that you are like in the middle so you are neutral and you are on the team side in the end exactly and I also think that helps me so I feel like I have had each role in the team already beforehand so for a while, I worked as a product owner, so I know this side of the team. For a very little time, I also did some coding, right? So it's not that I have like zero, zero background, but it's like very little, being honest here, like HTML uh, websites, right? Like back in the days in my student time as my side job, what I did. Um, but I've worked in several setups of engineering teams. so. I have always worked close with them. I understand them. And also as a team lead for them, it's my role to be on their side, right? I'm like, I see this also as in certain situations, protecting them from the things that come from the outside. And I worked as an agile coach beforehand. So, which means also that I have worked with the processes with all the people around it. So I bring all of the different perspectives. And sometimes I really feel like this person in the middle who can understand the product owner's perspective. I can understand the developer's perspective. I also see the business perspective and bringing all those things together is really helpful. And in the end helps me to take decisions in certain situations and kind of weighing off. So what, what is harder, what weighs more, right? What, what is more important in the situation and also see the impact of this decision that it would have on each and every department. Yeah, that's a very nice setup. Could you explain how the team works? So are you, do you have like a cross-functional team? And also how many teams you have in the company? You probably have some, some people that work as in your role in different teams. So how do you manage all that? So first of all, when the role was purely people lead role, we also had a tech lead. So the idea of this is to have then the counterpart on the technical side, someone that is actually still coding, is not busy with 
you know, people administration staff, not so much involved into hiring, uh, not so much involved into organizational things. And it's really like the, the tech body, so to say, for, for the rest of the team. On the other hand, we have also seen that having two leadership roles in within tech in the same team is really complicated and it can also create bottlenecks. Mm -hmm. What we experienced in some cases is that people didn't know exactly, is that something that I go to my people lead or is that something that I go to the tech lead for? Or product owners were like, so who do I ask or who do I involve when it actually comes to preparing things for the team? And then the answer was always a bit like, depends, right? So that makes it really hard for people to actually see who, who is responsible in the end. And this was the main reason also why we now decided to change to a bit of a different setup. So we're having the team leads now, and um, they are really responsible for the team's success and um, the outcomes that the team in the end is producing, um, plus also the people side of it. But what we have decided as a setup for a team, so it will always be a cross-functional team, but making sure that you have different seniority levels. So this team would always need an experienced, at least one experienced engineer that can also be the counterpart to the team lead or when the team lead can say, okay, I would rather delegate this topic now to someone in the team, but they have like a really reliable team that can actually also do the technical details on a question that a product owner might have. Yeah, I was going to ask because even just having a PO, a team lead, and probably a Scrum Master, not sure if you have them, mm -hmm. that's already like a lot of, let's say, leadership people in the team because even though we consider that the team is like one team as a whole, people always recognize the difference, yeah. you know, one in or not. So yeah, that might be a bit, and then you have like a team a tech lead. So there will be like four people, but do you have scrum, scrum masters as well in the team? Yes, we do. So um, we are a bit in also changing this from scrum master towards an agile coach role at the moment. Um, and there was also a bit of change in the team itself, but the vision is that part that the agile coaches are also gonna be part of the leadership team uh, itself to really help steer the team in certain directions and for me personally it's still super helpful because i cannot do everything right I, like i mm. it's it's super good to have experts in the team even though like you know saying that sometimes i don't end up with an agile coach is like oh you can do this yourself <laughs> um but uh, yeah in the end that's that's the general setup that you have like mainly the product manager and the team lead working together and the agile coach, then like a dedicated agile coach to support in terms of process, mindset, um, team spirit questions, right? Like those kind of things whenever they, they come in. I personally love it a lot to really have a, a facilitator always at hand when it comes to meetings that I really don't want to facilitate and I shouldn't facilitate. Um, I like to really work closely together with them to give them a heads up. So this is kind of the situation that's happening in the team. Um, please come to our next retro and help facilitate it, like focused on those, those problems that we have already seen during the sprint. Um, I think that's way more valuable to have someone do this instead of find someone in the team to facilitate a retrospective, especially when you want to fix a certain problem that you're having and everyone is already so much into the system and into the problem that then facilitating as well is usually not super helpful. And how do you, did you participate then in those retrospectives as one of the participants? Yes, I am you, every team's retrospective as a participant. I understand that knowing you as well, you have like a very cool um, atmosphere and everybody feels okay, but would you see that that might be an issue that you have a team lead in the retrospective like could you see a setup in which that could be an issue that the team would be like shut off yeah so what we're trying to so first of all i asked them in the very beginning if they're okay with it especially when i have a new team set up um, like the way i'm working right now with my team they just started uh, last year in september and in the beginning i asked if they're actually fine with it and i think for now it works out what i'm also trying to do is 
depending on also my schedule, I try to maybe not go every time, right? So that they can also see how things actually go without me. Or what I'm also trying to do is like really holding back and really rather like having the team discuss themselves. And only when I see that things really go sideways and against my, my actual opinion that I am having, um, then I try to step in and help them or also help them facilitate every now and then um, to actually steer the discussion, not really just, or steer the decision-making of the team and not really bring in only my, my decision, right? I'm, I'm rather trying to focus on facilitating for them as well. Okay. But I, I, can, I do see the situations where this cannot work, right? It really depends on the relationship that you have with your lead. Um, it really depends on the openness that you have within the team on the failure culture that you're having. And this is, for example, also something that we have been working on a lot in general in around home is how are we actually dealing with failures? Is it okay to have them? And what are the consequences? And of course, usually there are no consequences because the things that happen, are just they're just there, they happen. And no one's gonna come and yell at you or, or, or you know, punish you for whatever you have done. But the team has to learn that over time. And the first thing that you can do as a leader, in my opinion, is admitting failures yourself and also say like, hey, I didn't really react uh, well in this situation. Like, for example, we had a retrospective where also I got very emotional. And uh, the next day I went back to the dating, like, okay, I would like to follow up on this. And first of all, I want to say sorry that this turned out that way. Let me please explain why this topic was so emotional to me and explain my um, yeah, my opinion on this. And then I ask also for the team to understand that, yeah, everyone has a different position and also a different role to fulfill, right? And that is why there can be a clash of opinions at one point in time and you have to find an agreement in the end. Wow, that takes so much courage to do that. I love that. <laughs> and I but think it, it really helps yeah. for the trust in the team, right? I mean, yes, those are usually the moments where I'm a bit like, oh, God, <laughs> this is really tough. But afterwards, it always feels so much better. You know, it's like you feel this relief and you're act I'm also a bit proud of myself that I actually did it. Plus, you build yeah. up a good connection with your team. Of course, that's such a great leader to have that can be the first one to admit failures. And I remember a lot Nico Gonzalez, you know, when we worked in Free Now, he used to do that a lot. And for me at the beginning, it was like a leader that admits all his failures. But then it was just, I ad appreciated it so much. This is how you foster a psychological safety within the team and within the company. And this is also how you create a culture you want to live, right? you have probably some values that you want to live and you want to make sure that everybody feels okay. And especially the fact that the next day you came on your own and just apologized and explained why, I find that so awesome. I have noted a few things. So I, especially about the part about the facilitation as well, I really love that uh, what you're saying that sometimes you cannot be the one that gives all the ideas yourself. And I've spoken with my brother, Yannick, and he said that at some point he, he found himself that the team knew for somehow that he will be the one that provides the first, you know, the first idea. And then that they just don't have to provide ideas anymore. So this part of you go back and you let others speak before you do, right? And you let them express and maybe then if you see it goes totally wrong way or we are going into a loop and there's nothing out of it then you give your idea and just to like facilitate and move on but yeah i think that's super important and one more thing i wanted to ask you how do you do that me you are a team lead so in the end you are the ultimate responsible and you don't go to a retro let's say and the team decides on something that they will do how do you know that they you know agreed on something how's that process going because i have been in that situation i see that my role is a bit similar to yours you know i'm like the head of agile practice so i am not on the ux side not on the pm side not on the tech side i'm neutral but that happened to me that we agreed on something on the retro where the team lead was not there they just continued doing what they used to do 
even though I said that, hey, we had this agreement, you can read it here, but well, we continued as if it didn't happen. <laughs> oh, okay, now I see what you mean. Um, so yeah, when the team doesn't stick to team agreements that we have, I remind them of it. And it's either in, in team meetings, like whether it's in, in the daily or like other ceremonies that we are having, or I also um, remind them in one-on-one -on -one sessions whenever I see that thing, things are not working. I do have to say that I'm super lucky with my team, that like they really stick to the things that they are agreeing on. And, but yeah, sometimes it needs to, there needs to be a reminder. And um, what I'm also trying to do is again, explaining why we have decided to stick to this agreement or why this agreement actually come up and say, okay, so in this situation, we were you know, doing this again, like we used to do it, but actually we had this team agreement to change this and that so that we can actually improve on this item. And whenever you're not sticking to it, then you can actually point out again, the reason like, why did we decide this as a team? And it's not, and it's also easier to remind the team of a team agreement than reminding the team of something that I, for example, want, right? So. Usually what happens is, or what I also see is that some people are just too, too shy to actually remind the team. And then they are super happy that I'm the one pointing out, hey guys, you actually agreed on this and that um, in, the, in the last retrospective. So you have like a set of team agreements somewhere written mm -hmm. and then on the retrospectives, you just go there and uh, change yeah. them if you see that it's needed. And, and what we have a confluence page with uh, mm -hmm. retro action items and also team agreements. And I think it's totally okay and also normal to go out of a retrospective and just update your team agreements and not really have super specific action items in terms of next sprint, we're going to do this and that because the problems you are trying to solve are usually, you know, like yeah, human. No. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't talk enough we you know we forgot about this or that process or we uh we didn't have enough knowledge we need knowledge sharing experience those kind of things yeah but i i really like that and i think i forgot about this that i used to do that some jobs before that it's always so much easier to like fall back to an agreement that we made as a team as opposed to just say are you sure you want to do it this way? <laughs> because then you feel like you are providing feedback to like a, one person and this way and falling back on those agreements, you are just like showing, hey, we have this agreement. Are you sure you want to do it this way? It's so much less direct and invasive, easier, right? right? It's not so invasive, yeah. Yeah. And what about the situation that you are now on at retrospective and the team decides to change one of those agreements? What happens then? I mean, worst case, I have to wait till the next retrospective to share my observations, right? Why I think it was not a good idea to change it. <laughs> but why would you wait? I'm like, yeah, to have everybody in the same room and in the same mindset. And okay. also what I'm usually trying to do is whenever something comes up that I'm not super happy with, I state this to the team. So my, my best example is our discussions on how often to have daily uh, stand-ups. And I'm a big, big fan of having daily stand-ups every day. That's why it's called a daily, right? And there's some kind of sense in it. I do see that there are certain setups and certain situations where this can maybe not work. But I think the main idea of using this as one slot a day to actually coordinate with your team is super, super valuable. It should never be about reporting and telling everyone what to do if you go into this direction definitely not right uh, watch Maria's videos on the daily standards <laughs> yeah I have so many I'm so passionate about that and I have it in my notes to ask you about it so yeah we are getting there <laughs> so in the end what happened is that my team decided to just have uh, two stand-ups a week and I told them that I really really don't agree with this decision but I will let them try it out as long as they can prove to me that they're still finishing their sprints, they are still coordinating, they are still cooperating, and we are still really working as a team closely together. If you guys don't need those 15 minutes to achieve all of this, happy, go for it. Okay, and what happened? Well, we are doing I'm five so stand-ups. We are doing five stand-ups a week now. <laughs> hmm. 
I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, it's a really, really, this is also the emotional topic that kind of that I was talking about earlier, because I really believe, I mean, you know this from Prina, I used to do like get things done trainings, right? We used to do scrum trainings for all the noobs. I really believe in this tool. I don't believe in this tool as for me as the manager to see everyone and get an update from everyone. I believe in this tool to actually address questions because I have this like one slot where I actually see everyone once a day, um, give updates also. We have also like a general slot at the end where I can also share like, hey guys, I've been at the offsite last week and that's actually what we did. Of course, I could also drop a Slack message and write it, but I still feel even in this remote setup that we are in, it, it has a bit of, you know, like, time to connect with the team and actually see each other and then i'm like come on guys it's 15 minutes yeah and that that shouldn't be counting as a meeting <laughs> in the end <laughs> but now we're drifting back into my meeting no uh, i love i love that because i actually i think there is a big change post pandemic i would say with the daily and because there's a big change with the way we work we started working more in remote and you probably do that too it's so hard. Do you ever have like the whole team in one room? Rarely, very rarely. So uh, we also recently just added someone from Brazil to our team. So now it's a definite no. Yeah. And that's, that's I think most of the teams are heading in that direction. And it, it creates even more complexity, especially if you have like, let's say five people in the room and five people in their computers. You know, the dynamic is so hard because people in the room can talk to each other and the others don't hear what they say. And it's, it's creating a lot of problems that we need to solve. But mm -hmm. then also, I think for me, I wanted to talk about the daily because for me, the post-pandemic world, at least the daily in the, I would like to ask you, like, how do you do the dailies? Because the yesterday, today blocker format is like dead so that for me that it's like let's just bury it and let's just like put <laughs> fire to it do something let so it, we just i don't want to hear about it anymore people and and why because what you say for me daily is we plan the day so getting things done we need to think about okay what do we want to achieve what do we want to finish what can we do today so we can feel that okay it mattered and second it's about creating the connections and being a team and feeling like, hey, how are you? What did you do? And have a small talk at the beginning when we were waiting that everybody joins. And where I go to a daily that I see there's a silence at the beginning until somebody breaks the silence and says that they will actually start the daily. And then, you know, when we are late, waiting for like five minutes for everybody to join and you just see how people are bored like they just don't want to be here and I think especially given that then you see one by one everybody gives their update they don't understand why they are here they have to like remember what they did and instead of listening to the others they're like what did I do yesterday like checking their calendar and it just becomes so <laughs> against the point of having it so I I, I understand your your position and feeling very passionate about it can you say how you do the dailies so you actually yeah. because if you also came back from two days to five days what something there, must have been good right <laughs> yeah what is the the uh, <laughs> the catch where's the catch <laughs> so we actually um came from the walk the board format so that is what got us into the, the two days a week, because what happened was also, even though you go through each ticket, people were just reporting what is in each ticket and not so much focusing, what do I actually need to do to get this ticket into done, right? To move it further to the right of your board. Plus also, I mean, other things uh, come into place. We were quite a big team. We were had like very scattered topics. So not everyone was actually interested in an update from, from every ticket. And it just took forever. So in the end, what we changed, we're actually going back to everyone talking, um, but not in this, what did I do yesterday? What am I planning to do today? But rather in like 
So what have I been working on? Is there something that blocks me? Is there someone that I need to actually finish this? Mm -hmm. Or do I have a question um, that needs solving from someone in the team, the product manager or whatnot, right? So really, really focusing on, am I blocked by something? Do I need help? How do I collaborate with the, with the team? For example, this morning, we were actually really discussing, okay, so people were ready to pull new tickets, but we cautiously decided then as a team to say, no, so today is all about dev review. Um, they're gonna do another testing session, and then they're gonna pair up to actually finish one other ticket that is there before pulling new tickets into the sprint. And I have these proud moments. I'm like, thank yeah. you. <laughs> we made it. <laughs> I know you guys as developers maybe don't feel so productive if you don't have the ticket to actually code, right? And it's a bit of more coordination effort. And I see it's more fun to develop a new feature than actually doing reviews and testing things and making sure that everything works. It's a more of an exhausting day, I guess. But in the end, it's part of your job. And that's what I also make clear when I do expectation talks with all of my my team members so whenever they start we have like an expectation session where we state that towards each other and for me a big part in this is to also state it's not just about coding right it's, it's oh, i love that yes <laughs> say it once again please <laughs> it's about helping others it's about actually moving your product forward that you are working with so that also means you are refining tickets, you are working on concepts with the product owners, designers. This is also part of your job. I love that. I recently spoke with Luis. You know, Luis, he, he has a podcast that's called No es Solo Código. It's not only code. And I just, I love, I love this part because so many times you can find people thinking that when they, if they are engineer, a programmer, it's only about coding. They don't have to test it. They don't have to talk to the PMs or talk to the UXers. It's not, it's their part and they are here only to code. And I, I find this also very struggling part in the end to see when is a good time to actually develop or to, to include developers into concept work? When is a good time to include developers into testing, right? So there always needs to be a balance. Um, you also like for me as a team lead now, it's super important to find this balance because you will also not make people happy when they spend all their week in meetings and concept workshops because also that's not what they're passionate about. Let's be honest, right? They became engineers because they want to actually develop new features and write code. And that's what they're passionate about. But on the other hand, that's also part, part of the job. Yeah, makes sense. So do you do anything, like how do you collaborate with other people in, that need to be working together? For example, you have a PM in the team, but what about the designers? How do you do like the discovery part? Do you do workshops? What do you do so, so that you are all aligned? So it's also in the past two years, something that we built up and was actually also very hard to build up. We are coming from this, yeah, there's a group of people thinking of a new idea, a new feature, and then all of a sudden it comes to the development team and the PO just brings the perfectly written stories and there you go. That's what you have, right? I mean, apologizing here, I'm exaggerating, but to make this clear kind of where we're Yeah, coming. yeah, I understand. Um, whereas now we're transitioning towards, okay, so we have an initiative, we have agreed on this initiative. And the first thing that we're doing is a cross-functional workshop. So for example, right now we have an initiative of actually reworking our whole registration and login process. So what we did yesterday, we had a workshop with the backend engineer, frontend engineer, the PM, designer, someone from business and me. And we were actually sitting there all together and first collecting all the problems that we see in the current process and what we actually want to achieve. Then out of this, we derive an actual concept. Of course, this is definitely more work on the designer side and on the, on the product side to, to find, okay, so this is the vision of this registration and login process, what we want to have. 
and then also developers join in again and help stripping down the MVP or do different release uh, slices for this. So it's at one point, I, I find it very important to have everyone together in the beginning, then, you know, maybe spin off into the different direction and people bring in their expert expertise whenever that is really, really helpful or valuable. Then you come back again together and decide on how are we slicing this big monster in the end. And then everyone is so much more involved than you just receive this thing from somewhere <laughs> and you yeah. don't know why you were doing it. And you just get asked like, how, how, how do you do that? Or maybe you have a very technical PO and um, they already bring like even implementation steps and, and know, you know, which database to adjust and which service to adjust. And then you have it all there. You just need to code it. But that really brings so little engagement in the team. And I personally don't believe in that. That's great to hear. And do you have some kind of documentation? How do you document everything that's going to happen? Do you, because you said that you moved to the initiatives. So is it like in Jira or do you have like a place where you define what's going to happen and people can comment on it? So for us, uh, a big step into this direction was setting up OKRs in the company. Mm. No, no, I think the next thing that we can discuss ages about. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, for us, it was super helpful. So we started this in the beginning of the year, that there are yearly company OKRs um, that we are following right now. And then the teams break down their quarterly OKRs, thinking what are the next steps that we can actually contribute to um, in the next quarter. And what we are doing um, right now is that also for preparing the OKRs, we have a cross-functional group that also comes together so that it's, we started it with the whole team in the very beginning and that just didn't work out because we were like 20 people and it was just too much. Moving towards this, it really helped us to slice down things, really see, okay, we are contributing to something that's valuable for the company, that's our, our little part in, in it. And it also helped us get a way better vision of where we actually want to go. Like what is, what is the bigger picture to achieve and what are the smaller slices then you can, that you can deliver in each quarter. Plus it also helps you, I mean, you know, when, whenever there's a limited time, you have to think of the scope that you are delivering. So you cannot just, I mean, you could technically extend it also over several quarters, right? But then there's this feeling of uh, achievement that you also want to give to the team. And yeah, and so for us in general, it helped a whole lot to make things transparent. And then mm -hmm. that's also where things are documented in the end, right? So you have like, in the end, it's a plain spreadsheet where the initiatives are in and where you're also reporting how you are um, fulfilling um, the, the initiatives and then usually to the initiatives there's also a link to a mirror board or a conference page where, where things are then documented in more detail. Okay so just to understand first of all I understand you could define the OKRs based on the year annual OKRs for the company and then you break them down every quarter and then every quarter you review them and you break them down again. And then there is where you actually start thinking, okay, this initiative could help this initiative. And then you move those initiatives to Jira and create epics for them. Exactly, yeah. So when is the point that you know that probably you will do all of these things in this quarter? Is there like a point, okay, we have the epics for the quarter or is it just like continuous? work yeah so i mean now i i think we kind of know since yesterday i would say or the, this week <laughs> so ah. it's like basically two weeks before the next quarter starts and um, we have also said that we don't want to spend so much time in actually the preparation work because if you have like one month already covered of a quarter yeah. with preparation work you are like what else am i gonna work on right so this is always quite close towards the end of the, the quarter that you're setting this up. And uh, now we are entering this horizontal and vertical alignment phase so that people can actually give feedback. And um, yeah, you see also where the dependencies towards other teams that you are having. Plus saying towards this, if you already, know, like for example, we know we have like a very high dependency to another team, of course, we went to them early in the, in the whole preparation phase and said, 
we want to work on this, we definitely know we need to put this, so please put this into your OKRs already. So mm, okay. also kind of like thinking ahead, like whenever, so usually what happens is like everyone brings to, to the table, like what do they want to work on from business product and tech side. Then there's usually a bit of like fighting, <laughs> but we still like each other afterwards, even though sometimes it, it gets a bit emotional, but uh, I think we, we kind of managed to level this out over the time and also like go afterwards and hug each other. Like, okay, it's fine. <laughs> um, and then it takes usually like yeah, a, a, a week or two to come to agreements and to double check again, are the priorities right? Is there something that we missed? And then putting this down. Okay, that's nice. A nice success story of OKRs actually working. Definitely, definitely. So for me, it was now the second time introducing OKRs. And we are in the third quarter of planning it and it goes super smoothly for us. So at the moment, I would say definitely a success story. Okay. Can you just say how many teams you have all together? Just to be, have an okay. idea. I have to calculate because we just recently had a new two new teams starting. So it's 10 engineering teams. So there might be many dependencies. Yeah. And usually when you have dependencies, you say that, but do you somehow present? There's like a meeting where everybody presents their OKRs. How do you like sync with all the other teams? Or you just go one by one to make sure we're the trying, dependencies are covered? Yeah, we are trying to do this very asynchronous so mm -hmm. that there is a deadline for everyone to put in their, their OKR set, even though maybe the wording is not finalized, right? Mm -hmm. to update some KPIs in it. But there's like a deadline where you're like, okay, so now please everyone go through it, read it and see if you have any comments or if you have any, yeah, any feedback or if that is impacting your OKR set so that you need to actually adjust it one more time or talk to someone about it. Um, that is usually facilitated. We have like a core OKR group, which to be fair, mainly consists of the agile coaches and uh, they are facilitating this whole process. Okay. It's always so nice to have the help of agile coaches, right? Yes, always. <laughs> wow, that was, that's a lot of topics that we could go on forever. <laughs> so yeah. I think our time is up a little bit so uh, just before we go i have like two questions one is do you have any tips for first-time managers that you would like to share and second i will give you both uh, already so you can think about them and second is like the future how do you see the future of leadership especially given that we are in this remote world and i don't think we are going back to where we were before the pandemic so for you, how do you see that where we have to focus more our efforts to make that better? Yeah, so my tip for first-time leaders, I think, goes back to what we discussed in the very beginning. Try to be yourself. Try to mm -hmm. not stress out so much. Um, for me, what really, really helps is try to find a good environment where you also have other leaders around you, where you feel like I can actually learn from them and also... I have those people as my circle of trust as well, right? So for me, this helped a whole lot and big props to, to my teammates, my team lead teammates, mm -hmm. that there's like an open environment. You can just ask every question, you know, when we have this, whenever we have a problem with something in the team, we just go to this group, we ask for consultation, we ask for coaching from them and basically we coach us together. So that is super helpful to have. And that also gave me way more confidence over time to also see that those people are also struggling uh, with the same kind of questions, even though they have been in this role for longer than I have been, or they have been in the company for many more years. So yeah, in the end, find yourself a good group that supports you and also find yourself a diverse group. Um, that's also something that I really appreciate right now is that we are all coming from different backgrounds um, somehow. So that really helps also to, to, to give different perspectives or, or get other ideas from other people. And I think that's, that's the environment you should have to also grow as a leader. That's very nice tip. <laughs> <laughs> and how about the future? So I'm personally a big fan of this very flexible setup that we're having at the moment. I'm enjoying this a lot. 
I personally think it's very important that every now and then you actually connect in person. So doing like team days um, or doing uh, workshops, offsites, things together is really, really important. I don't even think it's going to change towards we have like three fixed days in the office. I even think the companies that are yeah. trying this right now are a bit desperate in controlling their people. <laughs> But yeah, that's my personal opinion. Maybe very also controversial. <laughs> um, but for for me as a leader, of course, the challenge is that I have to find other ways of connecting with them and also letting go, right? So like allowing this flexibility. Um, luckily for me, this was never really a problem that I don't trust whatever my team is doing or that I think they're just like super lazy at home and just do their laundry the whole day and walk the dog, I don't know. <laughs> but it gives you way more flexibility and you should use this for your advantage because I think your employees are way more relaxed with things. But the challenge for sure is how can I actually excite them about the product that you're working with, the team that you are working with, um, because it's very exchangeable, right? I keep sitting at my desk and the person that I talk to might be different, but in the end of in my setup, nothing really changes of what I'm doing. So you have to find other ways of actually build connections between people, excite them about what they're doing so that it's not so interchangeable. And I can tell you, I don't have an answer for this yet, <laughs> but I think that that this is going to be the future. I'm I'm excited to see if fluctuation is actually gonna gonna rise more with this more interchangeable setups and in remote situations that you're having the people are not so loyal to their companies anymore so this is really something that that we are discussing a lot in our um on our leadership team and and trying to see if, what what are the good ways of dealing with how oh, i I love it so much that you mentioned excitement of the team as opposed to controlling the team and making sure they deliver. <laughs> because that's actually the previous step to the delivery, right? You need to be inspired by what you're doing, happy with your teammates, feeling good. And then the loyalty, as you say, will just happen because somebody will say, I just feel good here. Even if you offer me more money, I just feel good. I have flexibility. I love my manager because that was very funny. Uh, Luis said that, you know, people don't leave companies because they don't like something. They leave companies because they hate their manager. <laughs> so yeah, if you create this great ambience, it's hard to just have people see them go because they feel like in the family right in a group of friends that they can support each other help each other very nice way to finish the <laughs> the conversation I really thank you so much for taking the time I'm so happy both of you <laughs> could make it and I learned a lot I, I really feel like you are doing you know like an extension of your scrum master work into the leadership and I think you should talk to many leaders about how you're doing it and help and mentor leaders. This is a really great mindset. I love that. And especially those, what we were talking about, the psychological safety, the excitement, everything about the courage to admit mistakes and just letting people fail is so great. Thank you very much. So good to hear that. And yeah, really looking forward to to more discussions with you, but we take them offline, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.